Welcome to the Board of Education, Queen Anne's County, September 4th general meeting. May I have a motion to go into closed session, please? Pursuant to the general provisions, Article 3-305 and 3-104, I move we go into closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this body, public body has jurisdiction to consult with counsel and to perform an administrative function. May yeah, I have a second? Second. So I have a motion and a second to go into closed session. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we'll be back at 6 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome Thank you. to Queen Anne's County Board of Education, September 4th general okay. meeting. We will now stand for the pledge. Please remain standing after for a few minutes or a minute or so in honor of our troops home and abroad. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So I need a motion to approve the agenda, please. So, so moved. Second. second. I have a motion and a second to approve the agenda. All in favor, uh, Mrs. Wright, please call the roll. Board members, please confirm what I call your name. Captain Kelly? Yes. Mrs. Harper? Yes. Mrs. Mosset? Yes. Mrs. Harlow? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. I have five in the affirmative. Motion carries. Okay. And I need a motion to approve the closed and open session minutes from August the 7th and August 21st. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve those two sets of minutes. Mrs. Wright. Board members, again, please respond when your name is called. Captain Kelly? Yes. Mrs. Harper? Yes. Mrs. Morissette? Yes. Mrs. Harper, I mean, Mrs. Harlow? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. I have five in the affirmative. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the first thing to begin our uh, meeting, um, I want to recognize a couple of new members of our Board of Education. First one over here is Shannon Billups, and Shannon is a senior at Queen Anne's County High School. She is the daughter of Laura Johnson and Courtney Billups. Um, she resides in Henderson, Maryland with her family. Her course load, and I have provided I was provided this information, so I don't know where they get it from you, but it's the secret stuff, I guess. Her course, course load consists of honors and AP classes. She served on the 2019 prom committee and is current, currently delivers the morning and afternoon announcements at Queen Anne's County High School. Shannon is humbly quiet, but she lets her actions speak out for her. So welcome, Shannon. Thank you. Thank you. And we have Skylar Pedroza, a senior at Ken Island High School. Throughout her high school career, Skylar has balanced her passion for dance and academics. She spends 20 hours a week mastering the art of dance, training in tap, jazz, and point, just to name a few. Skylar is a member of the dance company and, uh, at, at the high school. She has competed in Maryland High School Dance Festival and is planning to pursue a career within the field of dance. In addition to these accomplishments, she has excelled within the classroom. She's taken nearly every honors level course and will earn at least 12 AP credits upon graduation. Skylar also serves as a student government president at Ken Island High School. Fabulous, Skylar. Thank you. And, uh, both of these young women attended Mabe's um, student board member training, and Shannon also attended the Maryland Leadership Workshop. I have informed them for the information of the board that we are very interested in their opinions and their ideas, because they represent very important people in, in our system, the students, which are the main reason we're here in the first place. So I do encourage you to provide your input, no matter how humbly quiet you might be. <laughs> Okay, next is our recognitions. Okay, we do have one recognition tonight, so if you will join me up front. Yes. Student board member standing up. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> the 
first is Bishop. So, are we on? I believe we are on. We have one recognition tonight, so if our partners would come and join me, for the Energizer, there it goes, for the Energizer Bunny Award. Please join me up front. And this award tonight was nominated by Dr. Lois McCoy, principal at Mattapeak Middle School. And if you might imagine, I think you might by process of elimination, this recognition is for Mr. France. Mr. France, and these are the words of Dr. McCoy. Mr. France has been an invaluable member of our instructional leadership team at Mattapique Middle School. Mr. France serves as school counselor as well as the 504 chair. Mr. France is an advocate for all students using his expertise to deal not only with student social and emotional needs, but also their academic needs. Mr. France has an excellent relationship with students, teachers, the community, and his leadership colleagues. We are grateful that Mr. France worked tirelessly over the summer to ensure student schedules were not only completed and accurate, but sent to parents and students in a timely manner. We're fortunate to have Mr. France as our guidance counselor and member of the instructional leadership team at Mattapeak Middle School. We want to extend our sincere thanks to Mr. France by nominating him for the Energizer Bunny Award, acknowledging his tireless effort, hard work, long hours, and dedication to our students, our staff, and our school in general. So we'd like to congratulate Mr. France, Ed France, for the Energizer Bunny Award. Washington College is always an option. Yeah. 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 See that. A little pressure there, right? Yeah. Uh, we're I'm making a thing now. It is. Yeah. He's got to have a role model. Is anybody on Okay, next item on our agenda is um, our board and staff involvement. Um, I, I uh, did attend the, um, the uh, new teacher luncheon. It was very nice, I really enjoyed that. It's a quick lunch, <laughs> but I got to meet several of the new teachers and they're very excited about coming to our school system. I like that part there. Mm -hmm. Like they're happy to be there. I don't know if that was your feeling around Absolutely. the whole year, Absolutely. whole week. But but I really enjoyed that part, and um, I met some uh, other yeah, new teachers from Ken Allen High School. I was interested in them because I, my son attends there. Um, and then I also met um, several of them from um, uh, Centerville Elementary, Centerville, and I got to have lunch with some of them. So it's a good event, and uh, they're, it's so refreshing because they're really anxious to start teaching, and I, I think that's great, the new teachers. Dr. Kane, maybe I'll turn it over to you from that. Absolutely, so it has been busy since last we met. 
Uh, we started um, August, of course, all throughout August, we prepared for students and teachers to arrive. Um, before I do that, I do want to acknowledge our new board members and also welcome you. So welcome. Thank you so much. We appreciate that you're going to spend the year with us, and we're looking forward to learning a lot from you. You read some information, Captain Kelly, but you did not say, and I, I heard a lot about dance for Skylar, but Skylar also sang. She, she sang at the national, or actually it is a national event, it's the Carson Scholars Awards Gala. Mm -hmm. So she represented Queen Anne's County and, uh, and she did a wonderful job there. She also served as a member of my superintendent student advisory. So doing great things and we're looking forward to getting to know Shannon as well. So welcome both ladies. So um, August the 8th, we welcomed our bus drivers at the bus driver in service. We were glad to be able to do that. Also met with a group of African-American students on that day. They wanted to discuss some of the ways that African-American students can be made to feel like they are more valued members of the school community. So we'll continue to have some conversations with them and, and hopefully utilize some of their ideas uh, in both of our high schools. We also had the Shine Like the Sun culminating activity for the Summer Migrant Program, which was held over at Centerville Elementary Schools. Absolutely a wonderful event. Students won bicycles and backpacks. Everybody got a backpack and lots of good surprises and, and good food. It was a great time. Of course, uh, October, I'm sorry, August um, 11th, 12th, and 13th. Well, actually, it was the 10th. 12th and 13th, we had our virtual academy information sessions. We had parents attend um, all three of them, and we have, um, we're just about ready to register about uh, 22 families, I think, that we have at this point. So we're moving forward with that. And of course, our facilitator, Susan Grace Dubois, was there, and Kevin Kentop. Also, we had August the um, 13th, 14th, and 15th, we had our Leadership Institute. And I suspect that Mr. Uh, Paluski will want to say more about that. But we had um, all of our administrators there and teacher specialists. We had sessions on school safety, uh, communications protocols. Of course, we talked about the expectations for the 1920 school year, lots of differentiated um, instruction leadership sessions. Um, we worked on our employee handbook. Uh, had sessions where we had uh, our attorneys talk about uh, school law, and we had Mabe there who also talked about school law and Title IX. Uh, lots and lots of good information at that Leadership Institute. Um, on the 19th, of course, we welcomed just about 43 new teachers. We had lunch with them at Centerville Middle School, and I'd like to thank Ms. Chambers for allowing us to use our building, as well as Mrs. Passon and Mrs. Walbert for their leadership in coordinating um, the events that surrounded orientation of our new teachers. 22nd and 23rd, I had my superintendent's meetings for ESMIC as well as for the state PAZAM. On the 26th, of course, we welcome back all of our teachers uh, for the 1920 school year. And also, I was joined by Michael Page, who is the supervisor for science, PE health, um, and environmental ed education, along with Adam Tolley, who is supervisor for history and CTE, and Mr. Bell, who is supervisor for performing arts um, and visual arts, world languages, and media. We were guests on an education talk radio show hosted by Larry Jacobs, had an opportunity to tout lots of wonderful things about our school district in each of those areas. Um, on the 27th, I was able to attend the state board meeting. I represented Pazam as a superintendent. We try to have a superintendent at each one of those meetings, so I represented Pazam, but I was also there as a member of the Task Force on Discipline, which was led by Dr. Vermeil Green, uh, one of the state board members, and we made some recommendations regarding the impact of our current discipline regulations on uh, Maryland students and, and our schools. So that was, um, that was a good time to be there. On yesterday, we welcomed students in grades one through six, nine, and five at Sudlersville Middle School. And of course, today, we welcomed students in grades seven and eight, 10 through 12, and six through eight at Sudlersville Middle School. 
on tomorrow will welcome pre-K and kindergarten. So it's been a fabulous uh, few days and we're looking forward to visiting the rest of the schools on uh, Thursday and Friday. Just a couple of reminders on um, tomorrow evening at 7.30 at the Kent Island Volunteer Fire Department. That's the Queen Anne Goes, Queen Anne's Goes Purple kickoff ceremonial lighting. And um, several leaders in the community will bring greetings as will I. And uh, we hope that everybody can make it out on at tomorrow evening. The turf field dedications and ribbon cuttings will be held at Kent Island High School this Friday, September 6th, right about 6.30 before the game. Um, and then at Queen Anne's County High School next Friday um, at halftime, I believe. Is that right, Mr. Okay, great. So just a few reminders. We're looking forward to uh, another great month, and we're just so excited that school is finally back in session. Thank you, Dr. King. Mr. Peluski. Thank you, Captain Kelly. I'll be very brief because many of the things that I was going to comment on, Dr. Kane had said that, uh, but we have spent since our last board meeting completely just gearing up all of my staff and my department and many things that Dr. Kane had mentioned. The only thing I do want to mention is uh, we rode the bus on a first day with Mr. Denny. Uh, which uh, dropped student off to uh, Stevensville Middle School, Kent Island and Bayside. And just want to recognize all of our bus drivers for all that they do every single day. They're the first people that our children interact with and uh, they represent us as a school system and they do a phenomenal job. And I will tell you, uh, Dr. Kane, myself and Ms. Bass had a wonderful time, you know, meeting parents that were a little nervous or excited to push their students off to school. And uh, it was great to just, interact with students on the very first day. So I wanted to recognize them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for the information, student board members, at this point in our um, in our program, we usually rec recognize you all too. And I'm not gonna pressure you into it because you just started school today. So, but e each um, meeting, then you get to present things of what's going on at your own schools at this point in our agenda, every single meeting. So we're anxious to hear from you on that. And we'll do that in October, okay? Unless you had some today. <laughs> if you couldn't attend, just send the email to Ms. Mrs. Wright and she'll put it a part of our agenda. That way we'll read it for you. Great. Okay, so there's no pressure you have to be here every time, especially nights before big tests or, you know, something going on. Okay. Okay, citizen participation, please. Good evening. For public comment, we ask all speakers to keep in mind the following guidelines. Speakers should sign the roster, including their telephone number and address. Com comments should be limited to three minutes in length. Comments longer than three minutes should be submitted in writing. Questions or statements to the board should relate to a recent agenda item, an agenda item that is expected to appear in the future, or a matter of general policy over which this board has authority. Please do not discuss items related to negotiations. Those items are to be discussed at the bargaining table. This is not the proper venue to address specific student or employee personnel matters, especially those on appeal to the board. Comments about the actions or statements of individual staff members are not appropriate for public comment and should be referred to the superintendent of schools or processed through the available channels. Citizen participation is not intended to be a question and answer session. If you have specific questions, the board will make sure an appropriate staff member responds to your questions at a later date. The board respects your desire and conveys your right to freely uh, give your message, but ask as a courtesy of this board and our citizens that you respect the board's request to refrain from named citizens and name calling when offering your critique. Mr. Richard McNeil is on our list. Seems like an empty room today. And we're very happy to see you. Good evening. <laughs> um, Richard McNeil, um, here representing the retired school personnel group first and then some comments personally. Um, Start off with uh, welcome to Shannon and Skyler. Uh, looking forward to hearing comments from the uh, the young minds of the of the world and so forth. And Skyler, you probably don't remember me, but uh, I gave you an award in the seventh grade. Um, I was a uh, art supervisor, Mr. Bell, uh, at the time, and you we gave you an award for a beautiful painting that you did. I don't know whether you even remember that far back or not, but congratulations on being here, both of you. Um, yesterday morning, uh, we enjoyed, I don't have to go back to school breakfast at Denny's. Um, it was the first time we've done that. And we had um, 23 people come out. Half of those retired this past year. And we had a great two and a half hours of laughter, 
uh, talking about responsibilities that we had on that first day of school that we didn't have to worry about anymore. So um, we had a great time. Uh, thanks to Denny's for uh, supporting us down there. You know, they, don't, they really don't have a separate room, but they, they were very accommodating and so forth. But we had a good time and we had a moment of silence for the schools uh, for starting off in a safe environment. And, you know, in this day and age, a safe environment is not yeah, expected no. everywhere. We hope that it is for our children going in, but you can't guarantee that. So uh, I'm glad we had a good start. Uh, I haven't heard anything negative on that part. So thank you, Dr. Kane and Ms. Berluski for getting everybody ready uh, on that part. Um, also want to thank, uh, and just mentioned, uh, Sid, um, I've been in five schools and every one of them just look wonderful. The floors are shiny, the rooms are clean, uh, the new painting in front of the high school, both high schools as you walk in, uh, it very much needed it. The fields look great. Um, I know the, uh, both football fields are gonna be new, but all the practice fields and, and all like that, uh, where the band practices, everything was ready for the students and that just doesn't happen. And I know a lot of people think that it does, but it takes quality work and thank you for getting all that together. Um, also, uh, you mentioned going purple. I got my band yesterday and uh, all set to go. Um, again, uh, appreciate the Board of Education supporting that endeavor. We want our teens to be making good choices and, um, and unfortunately some of them uh, just don't, but uh, we're behind them all the way. So thank you for your support on that part. I'm looking forward to mentoring again this year and I, I thank uh, Janet Pauls for getting us ready and up to date. And uh, I have the, the group that I have uh, are at Ken Island High School this year and uh, very enthusiastic. So I'm, I'm going to see them in action on Friday. Uh, just stop in and see what's going on and make sure they're breathing in and out. And uh, as I told him, one of the last things I told him, I said, the teacher who thinks that, thinks that they know it all is finished from the beginning. And uh, uh, I know that in my years, every day was different, every class was different. And it uh, doesn't mean it was bad, it was just different. And thank you for your teenage leaning mind so that we can get ourselves together and make sure we continue to have the strong educational system that we have. So thank you very much. Have a great year. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Anyone else like to speak? So for your uh, info, um, Mr. McNeil is, uh, mentors the teachers, which is a good lead-in to our next presentation, our first presentation. This is Paulus. Good evening. Good evening. I'd also like to welcome Ms. Phillips and Ms. Perdaz. Um, Jackie Burt, is this? Okay, I see it. Yep. Okay, good evening, Dr. Kane, Captain Kelly, and board members. The purpose of my presentation tonight is to talk a little bit about the teacher mentor program. I serve as the principal supervisor and I also serve as the um, program director for teaching and learning. So the purpose of the uh, presentation of actually the program is to really uh, provide non-evaluative support to novice teachers to serve as critical friends and to increase the rate of success for students and teachers. And the mentors really appreciate the fact that they have someone that they can speak to and they know that uh, the mentors will not talk to their principals about issues that they are having unless it's something of um, dire need. The objectives of the program are to enhance the skills and knowledge of the new teachers to increase job satisfaction because we know if they're happy they will stay with us and that's what we'd like to have happen to increase student achievement and several ways that's done is through teaching and leadership models classroom and school management systems communicating with parents school policies and procedures and monitoring success so these are all things that they do with the uh, mentees 
the criteria is a part-time uh, hourly basis. We have experienced and committed um, folks, as Mr. McNeil spoke about. They have to meet the state criteria, so their, steals, their certification is still current. They have to attend monthly meetings, and they have to have a valid driver's license. So some of the professional development that we provide, uh, what, how does the adult learner learn? Uh, peer coaching, they have to really be proficient with the Maryland College and Career Ready Standards as they help those novice teachers. And they participate in counting and school-wide professional development as well as the new teachers. So we have, um, for our very first year teachers, for novice teachers, no experience, they visit them for two hours a week. For year two, they have one hour that they work with them. And then for year three, if the principal requests additional support for that teacher, they continue to provide support. And they're all retired teachers and administrators. And when we met at the beginning of the year with our new teachers, we had over 335 years of experience out of nine people sitting in the back of that, that um, room. So it's a great experience to be able to share with them. So we, we do have a survey each year that we administer to our mentors, mentees, and administrator. And the feedback from that survey is used to develop goals. So these are the goals that we have developed for the mentors. Management is huge. If the teachers can't manage their classroom, they won't be able to provide effective instruction. And for the mentees, we really want them to adhere to a lot with the, um, the school-based technology. We found that to be a critical area of need and keep mentors informed because it may look a little different in each of the um, schools and in order to plan for effective instruction. And the administrators, we wanna maintain a positive relationship with them. We do ask that whenever the mentors are in the building that they touch base with either the building administrator, the teacher specialist, or the academic dean to make sure that they know that they're there. We have lots of support from our supervisors. As a matter of fact, one of them supports us at each of our monthly meet meetings and provide updates. We also have support from teacher specialists and academic deans, so we meet with them at the beginning of the school year and they provide input on the initiatives for each of their schools. Uh, we've done a book study, Teach Like a Champion, which is excellent because it has some real-time strategies that they can go back and incorporate in their classroom. We started it last year, we're gonna continue it this year. Uh, system initiatives, that's one thing that we always bring them up to date on. They attend the new teacher uh, orientation as well, but we also spend some time on what these system initiatives are so that they can support that. They also get uh, the data. The data for each of the schools that they've worked with, they're very interested in how their teachers have performed. So we spend some time analyzing data at the beginning of the year as well. And they are responsible for completing a mentoring log and they keep that for the month. Some uh, turn it in on a weekly basis, especially if they're pretty adept with the technology. And then they also have another form where they have to look at the instruction, the management, and other characteristics of the teaching. So it's like, a, it's like a, uh, an observation form, but it's just giving them feedback on how they're performing. And they keep one of those on each one of the teachers. So it's quite a bit of documentation. And I read those every month when they're turned in so I can ascertain what the uh, issues are or where the strengths are in providing professional development for them at the monthly meetings. So we only have nine mentors this year and they are busy as they can be. As Mr. McNeil said, he has five that he's mentoring. So we have nine mentors countywide. Four of those mentors serve 10 elementary novice teachers. Seven serve 14 middle school novice teachers five serve nine high school novice teachers, and one mentor serves uh, one novice year two teacher at the Arise Academy this year. So they are very busy. We try to coordinate so that they're in the same building or the same area, um, and they do, they do have uh, the opportunity to, to request schools that they wanna work with. What is very promising to me is that the principals request them. Uh, they said, today I was in a school and they, um, the principal said, well, the teacher has had several years of experience, but could we just have someone to touch base with her? So they really, they really support the mentors. We also give uh, feed surveys and feedback, and here's um, what we come up with. The mentees, we had a 90% return rate uh, out of 45 questionnaires, so 45 were served last year. Total of seven questions, and I just threw in a few of what those questions um, were like. And they're, they're extremely happy with the support that the mentors provide for them. Um, the mentors all 
10 of them had 10 last year, uh, returned their um, questionnaires and, and just a very high success rate. And then administrators, we had a few who didn't turn theirs in, um, but 71% return rate, but 100% positive benefits of the program. So again, that speaks volumes. Our budget is, um, we do have three hour monthly meetings uh, for the non-participants, and that's every month. The only month that we have off is July. And we also have weekly visit by mentors to their mentees, two hours times 35 weeks. And then we ask that the mentors um, take the mentees out for visits to other schools, to other classrooms that are comparable to where they are teaching so that they can pick up some teaching tips. Um, and we offer that up to two days a week. And most of the time they take advantage of that. And then again, our book study. So I can say that I have been to every school uh, last week I visited every school. This week I visited every school. So I've had the opportunity to have conversations with our new teachers, with our principals, and I can say everything is going very well. Um, so in conclusion, some feedback from the surveys, as you can read what the mentee has written, extremely happy with the communication with their uh, mentor. The administrator was very positive about the mentoring programs, just one more layer to making good teachers even better. And the relationship factor, we know if we don't have a relationship with them, we just kind of lose them. And the mentees say that their mentor always has suggestions, they're always kind and positive and they're wonderful. And then um, again, another mentor said, helping new teachers adjust to the demands of the profession yet continue to see the value of their work. So it's a very successful program. I did do a little research today and it's the 17th year that we've had the program. So again, it speaks volumes to um, the program. Questions? When you say new teacher, that's both a new teacher coming in and also a new teacher to our system? Uh, yes, most of the, the uh, teachers that we serve have zero years of service. Um, we think that if they have more than three years of service, they really don't need support, um, but occasionally we do, but yes. Just maybe knowing our system, system and maybe knowing some people and just the camaraderie of letting, you know, they're all part of it. Mm -hmm. And this year when we took a poll of the number of uh, new teachers that had been through the system, there were probably about 15 of them, which is great. It's wonderful to know that they are coming Queen back. Queen Anne's County? Yes. They graduated from Queen Anne's County Public Schools and came back and to they teach came here. back to teach here. Well, that's a, I think that's a, a speaks strong volumes. thing. Speaks volumes. Okay. One question, if the form, you said they fill, the mentors fill mm -hmm. out a form and provide them to you? Yes. So it's yeah. not, an, not an evaluation of the individual, so mentor. Not at all. Not it's at just all. their thoughts on the program? I, I did bring a copy of, the, of them just in case you wanted to take a look at it. So. They spend time, at least two hours, in the classroom with them. And so they talk to them about their planning, instruction, classroom environment, and professional responsibilities. And so they talk about what's working, what um, current focus, what challenges they're having, what concerns they're having, and what the teacher's next steps will be, and then what the mentor's next steps, how they will support them. So it's kind of like a support plan. It's not an observation at all. Nope. Yeah. But uh, what happens is once we say, we determine what the next steps are, then we come back and make sure that we provide that support. So I do have a copy if you're interested. So do you do kind of like a sit plan out of that to to have like a, a, a schematic to help the mentors We move use along? it to drive our professional development. Okay, that's what I mean. So when we meet and we talk about, okay, generally what are we seeing with our new teachers, then that's where we kind of plan what our next steps will be. So most of the time it's the same thing. So it's time building management. blocks. Mm -hmm. So Dr. King, what I heard is 14, 15 of our new teachers are came through our system and are coming back to teach here. So a third of our new teachers are home Phoenix grown. County. Mm -hmm. Good. That's awesome. Mrs. Paulson, you're a perfect person to run this program with all of your experience. You've been here one year too, huh? experience. <laughs> <laughs> Forever. <laughs> well, go ahead, say how many years, Ms. Paul. 40 plus. There you go. <laughs> awesome. Thank a few you. A few of my former students sitting <laughs> sitting around the board here. Uh, but, put your hand down, Sid. <laughs> but that's okay. It's all good. It is good. Yeah. Yes. Love it. Good. Thank, well, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Paul.
So the next presentation is the ESSA Consolidated Plan. This is um, a presentation we wanted um, that Mr. Bell is, is uh, going to be giving to the county commissioners or similar to what he's given the county commissioners on September the 10th at their commissioner meeting. Just uh, as they get situated and pull their presentation up, um, it may have been mentioned to you, but I'll, I'll repeat it again, and Mr. P might also. You're going to see an overall, you're going to see a, a, a 30,000 foot view um, of some data. And just a reminder that you will get a detailed presentation as you do each year on the student performance data that you're going you're gonna to get a glimpse of it today. Um, and I know it's going to provoke some questions, but I just wanted you to know that you are going to get a presentation on student performance data. Um, that's goal one, and, and we do that every year. So tonight is just a 30,000 foot view, um, but you will get some more information. Mr. Pete and team. Good evening, President Captain Kelly, Vice President Harper, members of the board, uh, Superintendent Dr. Kane. For the record, my name is Greg Paluski. I'm the Deputy Superintendent. And joining me are my colleagues. Uh, one, Mr. Michael Bells, our Supervisor of uh, World and Classical uh, Languages, Visual and Performing Arts and Media, and many other things, such as the ESSA plan. Okay. Uh, also, my other colleague joining me is uh, Mr. Julie Forbes, who is our uh, Supervisor of Accountability, Assessment, and Data Management. The objective or the purpose of our brief presentation with you this morning is to do a very uh, high level overview of the new ESSA plan, which is a new requirement. Uh, the second part of that is to provide you with what's changed from the bridge to excellence, the former plan to the new plan. As Dr. Kane mentioned, we're gonna highlight for you uh, some summary data. Uh, and just to provide a little bit more background information, uh, last week at the state board meeting, they just uh, lifted the embargo on all the park or uh, the park MCAP data. Uh, so the information that we're going to share with you this evening, from a data perspective, is information that has been shared through our public uh, information office, our release uh, that we just normally uh, or just recently have done, as well as in your weekly board report, is the same similar data. What we are preparing for you in October is a, is a much more detailed level um, summary presentation of our data. That will include school level data. Um, so you'll get to see all of our schools that are kind of underneath the high level data that you're gonna see today. And you're also gonna see a data presentation on all of our academic indicators. So that is not, all of that information is not presented here this evening. So I just wanted to add another couple levels of, of information for you. Good evening, Captain Kelly, Dr. Kane, members of the board, and new student members, Shannon, Skyler. I'm Michael Bell, and I'm here to share with you the purposes uh, behind this year's strategic plan and some changes to the plan. So in 2002, back in 2002, the Bridge to Excellence uh, in Public Schools Act uh, was created, which resulted in a standard-based approach to school reform. This legislation required us as a school system to develop a comprehensive plan, essentially a compliance document outlining strategies for improving student achievement and eliminating achievement gaps. Now, if you fast forward to 2015, the Every Student Succeeds Act, ESSA, reauthorized the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. And now local school systems had to report out on how each assessment is administered, in addition to how our budget aligns with the goals, objectives, and strategies uh, detailed in the Bridge to Excellence Master Plan. Now in 2019, that Bridge to Excellence Master Plan has transitioned once again and it is now known as the Local ESSA Consolidated Strategic Plan, which narrows the focus and the alignment to accountability, reporting, and school improvement. So here I'm gonna give you an overview of the changes, uh, which basically it streamlines the plan from previous years. So here's what's changed uh, and what's still around. The executive summary, the finance section, and the needs assessment they're all still there. The plan most uh, must address now disparities in achievement with the following student groups. 
students requiring special education, students with limited English proficiency, students of any student group failing to meet or failing to make progress toward meeting state performance standards, including any segment of the population that's performing lower uh, than the population as a whole. Our areas of focus is limited to three. And this year, they're also including federal and state grant applications as part of the entire big package so that you can see areas in which we can support our goals and initiatives. Now let's start unpacking the entire strategic plan further. And starting with the executive summary, as you read through the entire plan, um, this part includes the introduction, the budget narrative, and our three areas of focus where we further detail the rationale behind our selected areas of focus, which is based on our data, how our student groups are examined, what strategies and evidence-based interventions address any of the disparities in achievement for our student group. Were those three, excuse me, were those three sure. areas of focus we're gonna told get to us to do or we came up with them? We came up with them based on our data. Okay. Correct, and, and this is where it starts to get tied into the Maryland report card. And then we'll share with you where we've identified, I'll let Michael uh, share with that, those three areas of focus. But the menu that we had to choose from were the areas within the Maryland report card. Okay. Good question. And so with the these- now behind the data analysis, how the student groups were examined, is that, that it's all tied together? Okay. All tied together. Okay. Thank so you. that it's evidence, so that it's evidence and, and data based informing our decisions. So our big three uh, areas of focus, academic achievement in reading, ELA, and math, which is the percentage of students meeting or exceeding the expectation. Number two is our academic growth in ELA and math. Those sound very similar, but one is meeting and exceeding, and then one is a snapshot of growth over the course of a year to break that down. Now, this also uh, it, uh, covers students who are in credit for a well-rounded curriculum. Now, interestingly enough, with my areas of expertise, um, this also includes sequential studies in world languages, uh, as well as fine arts. And it's important to note that arts and music are now included in the definition of well-rounded education in our state. And there's been an addition of dance, theater, and digital media to be included under the term any other subject that provides students with an enriched educational experience. So you know that, that's new. And three, qual student quality and student success, we're tackling chronic absenteeism and students enrolled in uh, well-rounded curriculum. So with that, I'd like to turn the floor over to Mrs. Julie Forbes, our Supervisor of Accountability, Assessment, and Data Management to uh, share our progress highlights thus far. Okay, one, one question for you, Go. Yes. So, um, on the quality and student success, um, the, well -round, the whole well-rounded curriculum, that's well-defined of what counts as well-rounded? It's, it's a broad-based definition. You have the actual definition with you, right? I do. We got it all for you. <laughs> so well-rounded curriculum, according to the Maryland State Report Card. So for students in our elementary schools, we look at grade five, and that's the percent of fifth grade students enrolled in science, social studies, fine arts, physical education, and health. So each of those weigh in. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and when we look at middle school, we look at students in eighth grade, and that is, those are those same um, categories and computational learning. And then when we move to- Computational learning, if you don't mind. Um, what is computational learning? So that's algebra, Pulisky. is that? <laughs> so this is, this is an words, interesting Mr. topic. Just two words, Computer science. Thank you, okay. <laughs> and, um, and then high school is really complex. It involves a lot of different um, courses, which I have the definition right here, but it looks at AP, it looks at CTE, dual enrollment, like those kind of things. And again, theater, dance. Dance, yes. all those. Mm -hmm. yep. Modern languages. And phys ed. And computer science, two words. Yeah, and phys ed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect, okay, and that's a great transition for me, so thank you. Um, and so thank you to Dr. Kane and Mr. Polisky for the introduction just in terms of the, um, the data and that, again, just to reiterate, you will get such a deeper dive on the data in October and I'm so excited to share that with you um, in, in just a month. But just that very 
kind of big picture of how we did overall as a district. Um, as it was mentioned, this data was just released last week on August 27th. Um, the English language arts and mathematics results were shared by the State Board of Education. Science and history have not been shared yet, so those are actually still under embargo, which is one of the reasons why our presentation is next month in October, so that we can share everything. Um, and just some really great highlights, um, you know, especially in English language arts. For grades four, six, and eight, this actually was for English and math, we saw increases in all of those grade levels. And when we look at all of our grade levels for English language arts, we saw an overall <coughs> increase of 2.8%, which is significant. Um, something I really like to look at, sometimes we do direct to grade comparisons, third grade to third grade, but when you look at students as cohorts, which is essentially a group of students as they move up the levels and you look back at those years of growth, which I'll go into more detail next month, in English language arts in grades um, three through eight, for every grade that had a previous year of data, every single grade level went up. And so I'll go into more detail, so that was really exciting to see. And then there's just some highlights about, you know, some of the wonderful work happening at our schools um, here. And English 10, we um, exceeded the state average by 16%, ranked sixth overall in the state of Maryland. Um, and, and even when we look beyond just the percent proficient, we also had 76.5% of our test takers meeting the required skill score of 725, which meets the graduation requirement. That's a great number. And mathematics um, pre, pre, uh, stayed pretty stagnant in terms of elementary, just a slight decrease of approximately 1%. However, we still had grade levels where we had significant growth, um, still ranked fourth overall um, in the state, which is fantastic. And similarly in algebra, that sink, sixth the ranking, uh, same that we learned earned for English 10, exceeding the state average by 20.5%, and had over 70% of our test takers meet that required skill score of 725. And this is just a table that shows you, this is just a direct grade to grade comparison. Um, it's not that cohort data like I, I spoke about just a minute ago, but I'll be happy to share more of that next month. Um, but you can really see the highlights of where we had growth in different grade levels. And again, this is comparing different groups of students. So, um, you know, a grade six to grade six comparison is going to be two completely different groups of students. Can I ask just one question? Sure. Looking down here, grade three to grade eight, because 10 is algebra and mathematics, it seems like the grade three is down, grade four is up, grade five is down. It seems like, they, but they're, they're everyone in English and language arts is down if it's down in mathematics and vice versa, mm -hmm. and it's up. Is there any reason yeah. for that? Yeah, you know, we'll, we'll go. It seems awful odd that they, somebody didn't do better at math or, you know, it seems like the whole grade did either better or worse than the year before. Yeah, we did see those trends uh, in grades four, six, and eight, just in terms of those direct grades, the students in those grades just, again, but we're looking at it in terms of comparing them to the students who were in that grade level in the previous year, so different groups of students, um, but when, I'll share that English comparison. Um, mm -hmm. for I just, next year. It just I don't seemed know. odd that both Eng English and math are the same thing. Mm -hmm. Similar trends. Just, that, 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 those, I mean, just, when I see numbers that, you know, Interesting. rolling around, it's, it's odd to me. Because mm -hmm. a lot of kids, you know, they excel in math but don't in English. This I know, but, but, seemed, but you're but, right. This shows. But which it's shown in both identity. each year. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it just, it's kind of odd. And it's not just one or two years, it's three or four, you know, it's bam, 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 bam. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you see trends with higher achieving years to lower achieving years back to back often? Every once in a while, it, somebody it, be different. It is, it is like, why? Could we find out why? Yeah, and so we're still unpacking I understand. that. Yeah, yeah. unpacking and that data. And it's 30,000 feet. We'll yeah, down. yeah. Thank you. If we figured out why, I guess we'd have all the answers, right? We'd have it all right <laughs> yeah. from the beginning. Not just. Yeah, it, no, you're right there. Yeah, and there's good, good, good observation uh -huh. here. And, and so Mrs. Forbes is going to figure out. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. No pressure. Um, yeah, and it's exciting. I and I love having these conversations. I just love this work because ultimately, you know, what comes out of these conversations is supporting students and equity work. Um, and, and so it it just it makes me so happy to have these questions. So thank you. You enjoy yeah. research. I do. <laughs> and equity work. I mean, equity. If it, when you when you see this the big document. It, the equity work, it's, it's all over this as a plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's really the intent of the plan. And then finally, I, I know um, I just wanted to share the rankings. So you can see just how we did 
statewide. Um, and then you can also see when we look at the Eastern Shore um, and you can just see the Eastern Shore ranks are all ones and twos, which is very exciting. And we saw some big jumps there. And then you can see where we ranked in the state and out of the state, that's of 24 districts. So that's quite a few. And just the last part, we're not going to read all the strategies and intervention, all these things, but just know that that's certainly part of the essence of the plan is, so knowing what we know, what are we going to do about it? And, and part is of what Dr. Kane mentioned that in the October presentation, uh, we'll get into this a lot more in depth um, per content area, per indicator. Uh, so more to come. Uh, a lot more detail, and as you're, you're thinking about this and, and generating questions, uh, I believe we've got it scheduled right now for the first uh, board meeting in October. Uh, what we're also considering as we speak with the superintendent is, is possibly a, a work session on the Maryland report card, uh, because that can be very complex to unpack and understand. There's a lot of vocabulary. How is it measured? Uh, that might be beneficial. Uh, as we look at the backdrop of, of our district and how we're being measured, as well as other indicators, academic indicators that we value here in Queen Anne's County Public Schools that are not necessarily a part of um, an accountability measure, but help us in determining how students are progressing through our school system. And one of our um, concerns too, is long-term concerns <coughs> that might have been in the audit was the, uh, the effectiveness of interventions. And this kind of data is what you're going to be using to determine that, right? Mm -hmm. right. Yes, and, and there's another presentation that, that you will receive that is on our reading interventions as well as our math interventions. And I know that we've talked about that and in, in the alignment and what we're seeing uh, with the, the, the more stronger alignment of reading interventions is that, that students are progressing uh, quite well. Uh, for its first year of implementation. So we'd like to share that with you. And so you can kind of see how students are progressing and reading across our system, which is, which is exciting. We're starting to see some immediate results. And uh, that is a thanks to a whole host of people, predominantly the reading specialists that we have in each of our schools uh, that are supporting this work at the ground level. So I'd imagine you'd see an impact through your other subjects as well. A, a strong reading foundation is gonna help in your sciences and your histories and your math. The, the applicability, yeah. sure, being able to transfer that skill <coughs> into, into other content areas. I believe we shared a little bit of information with you last month with regard to um, progress for reading interventions. Did we share that with you? I, I remember. Because Ms. Passon was here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We did. Yes, that's right. That's right. That, the success of the reading interventions right. and how they realigned them. Oh, okay. So, mm -hmm. but we'll unpack that more as well. Okay. Well, I have a question. How did um, I was looking back at the performance goals for 2018, 2019. So a lot of this is falling in pattern with what you had projected for your performance goals, which is awesome. It's all it just, connected and aligned. <coughs> it also speaks to our teams, <coughs> our teachers, the specialists, everyone. I mean, and the students who are having these these great sleep, great leaps and bounds. And, and I think. To echo Dr. Kane's uh, point is this is one big alignment game. So it's it's aligning the system, this ESSA plan with our strategic plan with every school's school improvement plan. And that's, that's a, a lot of alignment that has to take place in order to deepen the implementation of strategies that we deem appropriate to be able to close those individual gaps. But what you have to look at is at, at the base of it all is the individual learning of a child. Sure and how they adapt. So it speaks volumes to these students that they're learning to adapt to all these interventions that I hate to say the word throwing at them, but they're doing well. So thank God for everybody in, in, in the entire system that this is, this is so successful. I would agree. Okay. Anyone have any other questions? Thank so, you very much. So before I just wanna, so, uh, where we go from here, there is an action item. And so what we'll be seeking from uh, the board per the superintendent will be to approve a draft of our local ESSA accountability plan. Uh, from there, we'll present that a draft to the county commissioners, and then it will go to the state department for review. And then if there's clarifying questions, they'll send those back to us. We'll, if they want additional information or need more clarity, 
Um, that usually happens in October and November by the time that plan actually gets approved. Okay, so we're not doing it tonight. Yeah. Uh, you're just approving the draft. We're seeking okay. your approval of a draft. And the county commissioners also have to approve it. It's yeah. more of a it's more of an information item for them, Mr. Smith. Not necessarily an, an approval. So it's not a budgetary thing or anything of any any financial strings attached. Uh, some writing. Is there some money attached to it? Yes, because we're we're required to report out on um, on the funding of how we're spending. For an example, in our Title One, our Title Two, our Title Three, our Title Four funds, how are those funds being targeted to this plan? So that's where when when we fill out these applications for grants and we have to document, you know, this particular strategy that we're going to implement, we're going to use this money to be able to do that. Is it clearly aligned to this ESSA? accountability plan for their grants or something but they're not it's not setting something different up for the county funding or anything that we ask for each year well we also use our, our local funds to support all of this work as well so you're just showing him a finance you're showing a financial report on how everything where all the money's being used okay. that's right. what it is so you won't see a particular it's line right. item that for says as a consolidated plan it is our overall balance state correct I, I, I guess what my underlying questions we're not asking for or not approving something that we're going to sit there in six months say we got to have another 10 million dollars or two million dollars for to implement this this is already in our budget with grants and stuff and then we go next year's budget separately no but this is our work as we do it daily gotcha. yeah this is the this is the overall consolidated compliance document for the state for the state okay thank you thank, thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Next presentation is the Youth Apprenticeship Program by Mr. Todd. There's been a, a lot of conversation about our uh, new Youth Apprenticeship Program and Mr. tolly has been hard at work working with our business partners and and our schools and, and our students. So uh, we're anxious to hear what he's got to say. Thank you, Absolutely. Mr. Tyler. Good evening. Uh, Good evening. President Kelly, Dr. Kane, members of the board, welcome to our student members. Um, for the record, my name is Adam Tolly. I'm supervisor of career and technology education and social studies. And I am pleased to be here tonight to talk about our youth apprenticeship program. Uh, we have spent um, quite a bit of time getting this up and ready and, and up for final approval by MSDE. So I'm happy to share what we're doing and give you, give you an update and allow for some dialogue to talk about this program and, and any questions that you may have. So I just want to give um, just a brief overview of how this program came about. And as you see, it was established by Maryland House Bill 942 as a pilot program that began in Washington and Frederick counties. And basically, the state saw a need to supplement the actual apprenticeship program that was in place uh, statewide. So the apprenticeship program is for individuals that are 18 and older, which obviously doesn't meet the needs of our students in, in school. So they wanted to start this pilot program. And, and the purpose of the program was basically to, you know, to feed the, <coughs> the workforce with highly trained students. And so they began this program in 2016 in these counties um, and basically they they chose those two counties as one being more of an urban county um, and then one being more of a rural county both are large counties uh, in respect to to our counties on the eastern shore and you'll see in some of the numbers um, where they started and then in comparison to to where we are so i think we've we've done a pretty good job so currently allegheny carroll Dorchester, Frederick, Howard, Kent, Queen Anne's, and Talbot counties are participating uh, since this pilot has ended. Um, we were officially approved in April of this year, so we had to submit to MSDE our plan. <coughs> MSDE approved us in April, and then we've been going uh, officially ever since. So just a, another, another few bullets about the overview. Um, it gives the businesses just the opportunity to, to train students to again provide them opportunities to um, you know, feed their workforce basically. Um, and I'll get into some of the requirements here in a second um, and I guess I'll skip, I'll skip right to that. So, so some of the requirements um, as you can see, so it can start in the fall of a student's junior or senior year 
they must be at least 16. So a student has to be at least 16 <coughs> to start this program. They have to complete at least 450 hours of work-based experience. Um, and they receive one credit of classroom instruction and three credits of work-based instruction. So it's a four credit program. So it's actually, the, the program itself is actually a, CT, a separate CTE pathway, um, just as we have automotive pathway, carpentry, project lead the way, those are all pathways to graduation. This apprenticeship program is a pathway to graduation too. So if a student is not in, currently in a CTE program, a pathway, they can use the youth apprenticeship as a program for graduation. We, we have been careful um, and, and since, since this came out and it's, it's a new program, uh, we started talking to counselors about this about a year ago so we could get their input on what the best practices would be. Um, they're, they're with the students and, uh, for example, Howard County, they're, they are only uh, targeting senior students, seniors that have already met graduation requirements. Just because this is a new program, we, and, and we are sort of moving in that same direction initially because we don't want to put a student in jeopardy of not graduating because their pathway is, they have to have the pathway to graduate. So if we put a student in this apprenticeship program, they for some reason would not be successful, then that puts them in jeopardy of graduating, which we don't wanna do. Um, so I'll talk in a second about the students that we have currently, but that's, that's sort of the model that we're moving to. Um, as this expands, which I'm quite confident that, that it will, um, you know, we can look at different options, but it, it really is sort of tailored to, to each individual student. Um, one of the beauties about this program is that the students have to be paid. They have to be paid at least minimum wage um, to participate. So it's basically just like um, a job. So they actually have to apply. So, so the scenario would be a business is interested in um, participating in the youth apprenticeship. They fill out a one-page application with um, formerly the Department of Labor, Licensing and Regulation, and thankfully they've changed their name now to the Maryland Department of Labor, so it's much easier. So they fill out a one-page application with Maryland Department of Labor. Uh, Maryland Department of Labor goes out, vets the business to make sure they're a legitimate business, they're current on all their taxes, uh, all that good stuff. And then they submit a program of what a student would do in their business. MSDE looks at that program, we look at that program, and then they are officially approved as a, as a youth apprenticeship um, business. Once that happens, they would put out a description, a job description of what they are looking for. We um, advertise that description with our schools and then the students have to fill out an application. They send in a resume that goes to uh, the businesses and then the businesses take it from there. They are responsible for actually hiring, interviewing the students um, and then they take them on as an employee. The, the businesses though do have responsibility. So the businesses have to provide a mentor, a one-to-one -one mentor for students that are in, because obviously our overall goal is for our students to be successful. So they have to provide a mentor. Uh, they check in with us as far as how the students are doing, their progress. Uh, if there's any concerns, they would um, you know, direct that back to us and then we want to, to make sure that we address those needs and that students will be successful. So they get paid, have to get paid to do this, and they get credit for doing it. So it's really, um, it's really the best of both worlds um, when it comes to this. What, you know, one of the differences with this program versus some of the, the you know, programs in the state and, and elsewhere is that youth apprenticeship is a, it's a targeted program. In other words, students aren't just kind of thrown out to something that they may be interested in. They actually are, um, you know, they, they seek employment. They actually apply for the jobs that are out there, uh, and which, which really, to me, kind of funnels them in, and it's, it, you have a more, um, a more narrowed candidate pool, which I believe you know, makes students more successful. So they um, receive credit. Again, this is their pathway, um, and I'll share a couple. I think, Mr. Talley, one question. Yes, How do you protect the graduation pathway if they start in the beginning of senior year, though? That's, how are you looking at that? So, so currently, we we wouldn't we wouldn't put a senior in that hasn't met graduation requirements. So, one of our um, and not to jump too far ahead, but one of our students that is going to be a youth apprentice at Dixon Valve is a senior. He is already actually a he's a dual completer. He's met both requirements for graduation, okay. and he will be a youth apprentice. So, he has completed everything possible. He's a project lead the way completer. Um, 
So I, I think initially that's what, that's what we're looking for. We, we want to be very careful that we don't put a student in jeopardy of that. So um, ideally the way the, the program would work, and once we, once we advertise um, fully now that school year started and we start advertising for spring um, class registration, a student would start in the summer of their senior year, start working that summer, and then they would go into their senior year to finish up the 450 hours that are required. Uh, okay. so I, don't, I don't know if this is a part of your um, pr pr presentation, but what do the students get to work during a class time? It, it they take them out of instruction and they go for two hours and they have to come back to school. And I, I mean, is that a part of this program? I won't ask you more questions. No, no, you. please do. It, it varies by student. It, it really varies by student. So we typically, um, it depends, you know, by school, but we have approximately, it's over 200 students that are in work-based learning currently. So this is really, again, this to me, this is a very focused program that is, is um, you know, enhanced work-based learning. So it depends on their schedule. So one of our students um, that, is, that is doing the youth apprenticeship, he will, his first two periods will be his work experience. So he will, he will get up, he will report to work, for the first two periods and then he will come back to uh, Ken Allen High School for his second two periods. We had work-based learning uh, students work with us mm -hmm. um, for three years and uh, they had report to school first, the mentor brought them uh, to, our, to our location, they worked for X number of hours and they had to go back to school for the last period or two, um, last period of school and it worked very well. I mean mm -hmm. we did it like I said for three years sure. um, and uh, I just applaud the program and the mentors that were there and right. um, so that's why I was wondering how this worked when they went when they didn't go how 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 do they how to become successful is what, I'm, what sure. I want to know and, it, and, and again it really varies by student and it varies by their schedule um, so if you look at a, a student athlete and it varies you know based upon when when they enter into this program so if you look at a student athlete um, it would be more advantageous for them if we can get it in their schedule that they would go to work in the morning right. then they would have that afternoon um, to be able to right. do sports or extracurricular activities so it, it just varies by student very it depends on how many hours they have completed in the summer um, as well so we have to we have to reach that 450 hour mark but it's it's you know based upon you know what they are doing with with the employer that's a lot of hours to get in you know 180 days mm -hmm. It is, and but you know you have weekends that can come in, and, and again we we. Oh, look so at, they will allow that to apply as well. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Any hours that they work will go toward that 450 hours, and, and that's every okay. every one of those hours are paid, are paid hours. Okay. So. And what I'm hearing, you're you're keeping a close eye, so they're at no point of no return, where some student gets into this thing and then just working for money and doesn't graduate. I mean, you're keeping a close eye, so they can, if we have to bring them back in to make sure they graduate. I'm not saying one thing couldn't happen, sure. but we're not. You know, absolutely. So all the, so we have five students, and currently all five are have already met graduation right. requirements. Okay. So we're not in that, we're not in that boat. Exactly. And again, you know, Howard County, that is they they require it to be a senior. Um, and just the way our schedules work out, it, it kind of lends you know to this program actually that they have by the time they reach their senior year, most students have met their graduation requirements. So yes, we were being very cognizant. That was one of the first things that the counselors pointed out. Um, and they, you know, they are the direct contact with the students, so I will certainly, you know, lend to their expertise and um, definitely not want to put a student in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, let them put themselves in jeopardy. Absolutely, absolutely. And again, close contact with um, the businesses to make sure that everything is uh, working smoothly. There is a uh, person who's called a navigator that works for the Department of Labor that works with uh, five counties that feed into Chesapeake College, and, and they are in contact with the businesses as well. Um, but our, our counselors, um, you know, are very cognizant of the students that go in, and we've met with the businesses, all the businesses that have our students, and uh, we've been, and our instructors as well, we've been keeping, um, just keeping an eye on how things have been going, and everything so far has been running very smoothly, very smoothly. Uh, just a couple of numbers here of the number of apprentices that started, so if you look at that top number, 2016-17 school year, um, between the two large counties, Frederick County and Washington County, they had 27 students um, just in their, in their first year. They started to increase, number of businesses increased once the word spread, um, and then you look at the, um, then you look at the number of apprentices that they have today, 42 in, in Frederick County. Some of these numbers have varied where they don't quite have as many, um, but our number, again, we were approved, just approved in April, 
And so the school year had already begun and is wrapping up and we were approved for this program. And our goal by the end of the 1920 school year was to have five students and we already have five in and we haven't, we just begun the school year this week. So we're, we're very impressed, we're very happy. Um, again, we're gonna be looking at the next student registration period in the spring to really push this out and to, to um, give this opportunity to our juniors and seniors um, so that they can take advantage of this and and hopefully you know the word spreads for employers and I really think that once um, once the word gets out that we'll start to see many board businesses um, jump in but but again I, I'm very impressed with having five students in very successfully having five students in I'm gonna talk about them uh, in a second these are just some of the occupations um, that are represented in in the youth apprenticeship Initially, I think what the state was focusing on was really STEM-based occupations. Um, then they started realizing that it, we, we don't have to limit it just mm -hmm. to STEM, that this is, you know, we're looking at the, the workforce as a whole. And so there's I mean, just, a, just a myriad of businesses over the state that are represented, and you see some of them here. Um, and it's just, again, it's about offering opportunities to students, offering them opportunities where they can um, grow, excel, earn, uh, just like in our CT programs, earn industry recognized credentials, earn certifications, and you know become become a highly skilled uh, worker. That's, so that's the goal of this program. So we're we're open in Queen Anne's County to to all businesses. We just want to make sure that they have a an educational component, that room for the students to excel, to grow, and that they're going to receive a good experience through the program. And that's what the the, the system that is set up. That's what it does. They apply. Um, as I said, to Department of Labor, MSDE looks at their um, credentials, they look at their program that they have laid out, we look at it to make sure it's a good fit for our students and then, and then we place the students. So they don't necessarily have a student in mind when they're, I mean, they're just come forward to us because you say they, there's a competition, you know, in applications. And Absolutely. All. Okay. I see. Absolutely. I'm, I'm so when we, and when we started, again, we, we, are, we are brand new to this um, and you know, we, we just kind of met with the businesses and I talked with them and, and, and asked them to provide just a, a description. What are we looking, what are you looking for in a student? And they put together some descriptions. Uh, they're posted on our, our website now, the, the ones that are, and they're all filled. Um, and so hopefully once, um, you know, we get out again and these businesses are looking for students again for next year, um, that they'll do the same thing. They'll post these descriptions, students will see them. So we're gonna continue working on on marketing, getting this out to parents, getting this out to students so they see the, the opportunities that are out there. So currently we have, uh, like I said, we have five youth apprentices. Uh, you heard uh, the last board meeting, Mr. Marsh from Y River Marine speak. Uh, he mentioned that he had 20 student applicants, which is, which is amazing. Um, so he hired one of the students from Queen Anne's County. And just to, to talk about his program just, just briefly. So we don't have a, marine mechanic marine tech program here in Queen Anne's County so we looked out um, he looked out to Chesapeake College Chesapeake College provides that uh, marine tech program there so that counts as their one credit of instruction and then his the three credits of work-based experience are at Mr. Marsh's business so that's how we get to that get to those four credits um, another good example so we have a youth apprentice starting at Dixon Valve like I mentioned uh, Dixon Valve uh, manufacturing business we don't have a manufacturing pathway but they have created um, a, actually a very extensive uh, educational program that students will go through it's uh, they're using an online learning management program called tooling you um, students go through certifications they earn certifications as they go through this program um, and it, again it's very extensive actually and then they'll do the work experience obviously at Dixon Valve and the student we have there like I said is a senior He's already met his graduation requirements um, as, a, as a dual completer, and then he'll be starting there uh, in the fall. So NetVision Consultants is our, um, is our third business. They were, they're a um, computer analytics company in, in the Chesapeake Bay Business Park. And initially they, they heard about this. They reached out to us and said, this is, we're looking for one student to do, possibly work with us to do some computer programming. Um, and computer program, programming is not my expertise. So the first thing I did is reach out to our instructor uh, and said, this is what the business is looking for. Um, and he was able to identify six students that were, that were possibilities for this program. Um, they went through, we worked with guidance at Kent Island um, and 
they kind of narrowed it down a little bit to students that could that would fit, you know this would fit into their into their schedule um, they had three students that applied and they said we can't choose between the three and they hired all three of the students uh, they started on July 15th working there the um, instructor um, has I've been in contact with um, the the mentor there, our instructor has actually gone out there twice to check on the students. He's, he's very excited about the program and uh, they are just doing a phenomenal job, phenomenal job. Um, students are getting paid $15 an hour, um, which is absolutely amazing, I think. And again, so this in this circumstance, this was an opportunity that was in a field of their interest. They were computer science students. They saw the opportunity. They were very versed in what this business was looking for and obviously they have been um, been very successful so the, these are the opportunities that we're looking for for students just opening this up um, and you know just giving students a chance to go to a business to be able to apply the skills that they that they have learned um, you know obviously these these students have been very successful in what they're doing and um, we have some very talented students here and I think the the business community um, has seen that and we're finally starting to to really make that connection here so just very, very happy about this program um, to date, and we want to just thank the, you know, thank the business community for their support. Um, ever since I started, we've been in close contact working with the Chamber of Commerce, um, and you know, without their help and identifying businesses, we we wouldn't be able to do this. So again, it's just again making that connection between our education world and the, the business world, and um, you know, Dr. Kane, Mr. Pluski have been very supportive. I've probably come to the point of pestering them at some time about the uh, apprenticeship program, but I feel very uh, passionate about it, um, as I know they do. So I just, we're, you know, we're just all about giving opportunities to students, individual opportunities. And like I said, this, there's no, there's no cookie cutter for this. It varies by student, it varies by their schedule, it varies by their interest, um, and it expands over, you know, any, any field that's out there that interests students. If we can give them that opportunity uh, and they start to make a connection. Um, also, the, the, one of the other pieces that um, is not really talked about a lot um, is that it gives students a chance to explore and they may figure out that they don't like the field that they thought they were going to like. Um, and that's, that's just as rewarding as figuring out that they do like it. So it gives them a chance to say, well, this is not really what I thought. Let me go try to do something else. So if we're able to offer that opportunity to them uh, through their high school experience, I think it's a wonderful thing. Just a quick quote from the governor, has been support all over the state, um, and we're going to continue to to grow our program and to, to advertise this. So any questions? One question I'd have, when I look down on the um, representative occupations, I don't see teachers. Could we, could we get involved with this as far as possibly in pre-K, elementary, have some students that are seniors come back into this, not high school, but maybe elementary, and mentor and get, get credit for that? Absolutely. Um, Dr. Kane and I had some conversation on that. Um, talked to Mr. Fister as well about students with accounting opportunities here. So yes, our students that, that go through the, the Teacher Academy program, um, they come out with a with a para certification. So they are certified just as our paras are. Um, so we have to work through logistics as far as how that works with the school system and if they are a student to get paid while they're working for the school. So there are some logistics, and this, the state has looked at that as well, but, but absolutely. Um, I mean, and, and the two-edged sword, they might like it, they might not like it. Absolutely. But at least get them indoctrinated to it and see if they do. And it seems like we're always looking for qualified people. We absolutely are. And just to piggyback on that, recall last time we met, we talked to you about the Teacher Academy of Maryland program. So we do have a program where we are grooming uh, our current students to be teachers. Mm -hmm. um, this adds a different layer to that. So, but we are working on that Teacher Academy of Maryland. We have that going currently. Well, there's the legal part behind it because they're a student and then they would be an employee. So we have, there's, it, it well, runs a fine line. We've got some work, we've got some more homework to do on it. The important thing that I wanted to just bring out is that we do have a program where we are mm -hmm. building teachers. Um, right or growing our teachers, and they are getting that experience because that's just part of that program. Um, the pay part and the certification part is something that Mr. Tolley has to work out. Sure. Yeah, I'm but sure there's two mm -hmm. factions would like Absolutely. it and not like it, because I can understand that that thing politically, but you know, if, if they're doing a, 
doing something, it would be a pathway too that I would just think, you know, we're probably the biggest employer in Queen Anne's County. Absolutely. I had a question about um, the eligibility. You said if they figured they didn't like what they, or it just wasn't a good match, do they lose their eligibility or what's the safety net there to? No, absolutely. And, and I say, you know, that they figure it out, but I, you know, I say that in terms of them completing it and they go through and they, they would complete and complete their 450 hours and then maybe determine that that's not a field that they thought that it was and they want to explore something else. So um, we, we hopefully don't run into that scenario where they get halfway through and they say, I really don't like this. But again, if, if that does happen, we're, we're looking at students who have already met that graduation requirement, so they're not in jeopardy of not, not graduating. Or if it's the employer who says this is not a good match. And that could happen. Yep. Yeah, but again, it's it's not the the program does not allow for the for the employee to say uh, without communication with us um, leading up to you know you know possible termination that they didn't give us warning. We didn't have communication. Um, again, they're required to to provide a mentor um, so that the mentor is working with the student. And uh, it's been made clear to businesses um, through Department of Labor that that's not a scenario that we want to that we want to get into. And they, they don't want that either. Uh, it is possible. Um, I haven't heard of any scenarios like that in, in the, the counties that have been participating. I'm sure it may have happened, but um, we, we want to try to be proactive. And I, I really think that, again, this compared to a work-based learning program that the students have to go through all these steps to apply, that it's really, it's really narrowed them down and funneled them down to something that they really want to do. So. And that's the, that's the important thing is this is different from the regular work-based learning programs that we're all familiar with. This is a more structured program. There's responsibility not only on behalf of the school for the students, but also for the business partner. So it's, it's more formal. It's different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's, not an app. There's not an app that on either side, basically. You're pretty much committed. Absolutely. And it's a semester or a term, but it's not, you know. Sure. But like you said, I think it does go both ways because you learn it might take you a while, but just learn that that's not the path you want to take. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Well done, Mr. Thank Tally. you very Thank much. You. We're going to take about a 10 minute break. We'll be back at 730 to start over. Thank you. Welcome back to the meeting. Next item on our agenda is the superintendent's FY 1919, I mean, FY 2019, 2020 goals. We discussed these with her part of uh, the superintendent's contract is to work with the board to establish goals before September 15th to um, with her perf uh, performance goals, what we expect of her and what she thinks she can accomplish during uh, that ye this specific year. And we had a big meeting about this and discussed it on uh, um, August the 21st during our work session. And we made a few modifications and we came up with an agreed upon plan so as we discussed earlier, we are going to take a vote to approve the superintendent's goals. <clears throat> so I need a motion to approve the superintendent's uh, goals. Can I interject or yes. do we mm -hmm. want to highlight any of that, Dr. Kane, or just go with it since we've already... Did you have anything you want? Is there anything you want to highlight or should we just go ahead and approve it? Since we had a work session on it um, in the end of August, I don't necessarily want to go through any of it. Okay. Um, I think that you'll, you'll start to notice the alignment with our goals. And just as we talked about just a little bit ago and what schools are expected to do with our, with our, what our exec team and central office folks are expected to do, this is all aligned. It's part of that alignment. So. Not in th anything in particular. We continue to work on that equity piece, and that's across the district, and that's a pretty big one. But um, I think this is a good representation of the the work that's being done in this district. So yes. And I, I like the, the youth apprentice program. Um, hopefully, having a 50% increase. I, I encourage that highly. Oh, Mr. Talley's gone. Oh. Mm -hmm. So thanks to him for that. So okay, I make a motion that we accept the superintendent's performance goals for 2019-2020. I have a second for that. Second. Okay. All in favor of accepting the superintendent's FY 1920 goals. Mrs. Wright. Well, my Ms. Peace is fine when I call your name. Captain Kelly. Yes. Mrs. Harper. Yes. Ms. Lissette. Yes. Mrs. Harlow. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. I have five in the appointment. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. And the next item to uh, action item to approve, uh, you, Mr. Bell presented the uh, as a consolidated plan draft 
And you're asking Mr. Pulisky to inform us what you're trying to. Yes, Captain Kelly, on behalf of the superintendent, we're asking that the board approve the ESSA consolidated draft, ESSA consolidated draft plan. Okay, and that goes forward to where? It, well, from, from this point forward, uh, we'll share it with the county commissioners. Mm -hmm. uh, then October 15th, we have to submit it to the State Department, and then it, it will go through a formal review process there uh, and feedback back and forth, I think, for a final adoption around the 15th of November. Uh, and we can update you once that information, once we get final approval. Okay, so it, it lays as a draft the entire process. Yes, ma'am. And then that means if it's the 15th and around probably the first meeting in December, we approve it as a final, uh, or would that be? I, I don't think that we've brought this, I don't think that we've brought it back formally for. So if there is an, a change, I think that we'll, we'll bring it back we'll bring with the for the final version. Um, either way, we need to update you to let you know that it was approved in the format that it was given, that you've approved the draft of, or we made X changes, and then we'll bring it back for your approval for it, if there are changes. Okay. One thing I looked in here, the solar field at the high school, that's online now? Yes, the solar field. So it feeds uh, Queen Anne's County High School, Centerville Middle School, and we're also to, able to net meter that to Kent Island High School. So we're safe. I mean, was it a base grant based, funded at some point, I guess? No, it's a, a performance contract, um, a PPE with power the solar. performance contract with uh, Solar City, okay. uh, which is now Tesla. So basically, with that system, uh, don't quote me on this, but it's about six cents, six and a half cents a kilowatt for 20 years. Compared to like right now, we're paying 13. We're paying 13 with distribution. <coughs> yes, 13 for supply and distribution. The six cents is just energy. The um, six six cents is just energy um, for what we pay um, for that for those three schools. <coughs> you pay six cents. Yep. Oh, I okay. get you the exact number. It's okay. around six cents, five and a half, six and a half cents, right in that. Time. So we're saving a penny or two. Oh, we're saving quite a bit. Yeah, but distribution is in the 13. We still have to pay that, right? Or we still have to pay distribution, but it's not nearly as much as what you're transmitting. Um, you might, and you normally, if you want to figure it out, you add one or two cents to that. So if you're paying five and a half cents, by the time you end up for distribution for solar, mm -hmm. you're paying about six and a half, you know, maybe seven cents for that total package. Of, Sometimes I just like to see the numbers. To, no, we can show you. Yeah. It's, but the good thing about the, this package, it's there's no escalator. It's one set amount for 20 years. It, it, it caps our supply. Yes, it's one it's one set price amount for 20 years. Okay. It will never increase the cost. But our, but our distribution can go up. <coughs> distribution could yes, but that's a smaller impact compared to the actual. Usually, I mean, this is just my home. My distribution is as much as my power. Sometimes. What's that, sir? On my home, distribution is almost as much as my power. It, it depends, but we also go purchase a lot of our energy from a third party, okay. from basically Washington Gas and Electric. And then Delmarva Power, you pay for the distribution part right. of it. Ours, the distribution is a little bit smaller than that. Okay, your distribution is less than the regular homeowner. I can show you the okay. stuff. Okay, thank you. Any other questions about the plan? So a motion to mm -hmm. accept the ESSA consolidated plan draft for 2019-2020. Second. A motion and a second. All in favor, Mrs. Wright. Board members, please respond when your name is called. Captain Kelly? Yes. Mrs. Harper? Yes. Mrs. Morissette? Yes. Mrs. Harlow? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. I have five in the affirmative. Motion carried. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next item is the approval of the human resources report. We have substitute bus driver report that's mixed in with that. Do we want two separate decisions or? It's going to be fall under one. The fall substitute under. bus drivers can drive for the county or they can drive for the contractors. Okay. So I need a motion to approve the human resources and substitute bus driver report that was, was discussed in closed session. So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor? This is right. 
Board members, when your name is called, please respond. Captain Kelly? Yes. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Morissette? Yes. Mrs. Carlisle? Yes. Mr. Smith? And this is just, uh, I might have missed something. This is the wireless access point? Uh, just no, no, no. no, no. 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 This is the HR report that okay, we approved I'm sorry, I'm along sorry. with the bus yes, drivers. Yes, right. yes. I have five in the affirmative. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, did you say yes? You did? Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, that's approved. Next item is uh, a contract for the purchase of CDWG for wireless access points and licensing. Thank, uh, ooh, wow. Thank you, Captain Kelly. Uh, board members, before using a, an approval, a request for approval for contract to CDWG for wireless access points, uh, CDWG is one of the E-rate providers that will provide discounted uh, merchandise to us up front. So we were getting a 60% discount on, uh, because we're purchasing this through our E-rate funds, which is uh, through the Universal Services Library Program, where there's a couple dollars added to everybody's telephone bill, goes into a big governmental fund. We apply for it based on our farms uh, percentages and our usage and our expenses uh, related to telecommunications, and therefore we get a rebate back. So with that, we're able to garner $312,000 worth of merchandise for 160, I'm sorry, $124,848. So with that, we ask for your approval. Mr. Vister, can I ask you on this yes. quote confirmation, it says page one of page two, and there's only one page here in our documents. Sorry, let me get there. I mean, is the second page blank or you don't know? I, I can certainly research for it. I would imagine it was it was probably more of mailing addresses or something like that because this here is the is the only um, items that we're buying and you can see that the total is the 312 which was referenced in, in okay. our cover sheet. Um, I don't have page two in okay. my uh, scenario either. I mean, the only thing is there could be some terms and conditions on page two that we don't. I don't believe so, but... Um, is it necessary to do it tonight? Is time is of the essence on this? Um, page two. I'd have to ask Mr. Combs on that. I, I do know that we, we have a limited window to be able to take advantage of these funds uh, because they are through the governmental uh, E-rate program. Um, if we can, do you want to table it for just a second? We'll go on to the next <coughs> one. And then perhaps okay. I can get you an answer and come back okay. and see if I have it in my email sorry, or something. I, I mean, I just, no, I the second page questions. has conditions on it. Yeah. I would like to see them. Okay. All right. No. Thank you, sir. Yep. Um, okay. You find out that answer for us. Yes. We'll yeah. come back to it. Okay. So I'm sorry. It looks like we can move this to the work session for September 18th. Correct. Yeah, I think it's just the deliver two addresses, but I want you to be comfortable, okay. but Thank we'll, you. we'll move it to then. And, okay. and maybe I can get an answer before we even adjourn today. Okay. okay. Good catch, Kim. What'd you say? Good, Good catch, catch, Kim. Yeah, thank you. Okay, the next item is the approval of professional services contract to Mrs. Best uh, as the role, in the role of Director of Human Resources. Interim. Dr. King. Okay. Yes. Okay. Again, uh, once again, thank you, Captain Kelly. Um, before you is the contract, employment services contract for Mrs. Bass. Um, she's been serving in that role since June 21st. Um, we thought it would be a little bit of a shorter stint uh, based on our advertisement for a replacement HR director. That did not come to fruition, so we're looking to extend her services um, through November 30th. But if we were find a successful candidate, we could certainly end this sooner than November 30th. So we're requesting because of the total compensation package beyond what she's already put in, would put in above our current $25,000 contract limit. So we're asking for your approval to continue this contract. So you're saying that this original contract, though, ended September or um, what, September 1st? It went from June 21st to August 30, 31st? Because you're saying down here, her interim work ends on or near September 1st upon the hiring or the- Yes, the I'm sorry, yes. That was what the original contract was based on, thinking that we would have a hire by that point. Since we have not, we are moving forward with continuing with her services with your approval. Uh, is, does she work one, two, five days a week? Five. She is a, mm -hmm. working five days a week. Five days every day. Mm -hmm. Evenings. 
Now, can, can you explain to us how we've moved along on trying to hire so we can make sure the public understands? Absolutely. So we had interviews in August as we had planned to. We interviewed, I believe, um, four candidates. It was four or five. I don't have them right in front of me. Four or five candidates. It was a team of people on the panel. So we had our teacher of the year. We had a representative from the support um, unit who was on the team. We, of course, had members of my exec team on the, um, on the panel. And we also had a, um, a principal, an administrator, so a CERT two. So we had CERT one, CERT two, CERT three um, um, on, the, on the interview panel as well as executive staff. And we did not uh, select any of the candidates that came forward. And what are our plans to, to get this? Time? So we, in, we put the advertisement out again. The first time we advertised nationally, and we advertised nationally again on yesterday with one of the largest um, advertisers of educational, professional educational vacancies, and that's Ed Week through Top School Jobs, um, as well as a few others. So we have put that out again on yesterday. We generally run it for about seven days, and we run it generally uh, until filled, but we wanted to put it back out in front of the public and we'll continue to do that so that it is at the forefront of, uh, of any applicant's attention who qualifies. So and I understand this is, um, since we've hired everybody to start school, this should be the highest priority. It is a very high priority, yes. At this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've hired everybody for classroom positions, school positions, and we do have this central office position that we need to um, hire for, in addition to a couple of others that we talked about earlier today. I know, I know it's a tough thing, but I just still would love to see us find people in our system, if we can. Mm -hmm. Yep, if we can. We've had that conversation. Yeah, right. Yep. Just, I just have yep. to bring it up every yep. time. Yep, absolutely. We have, and if we don't mentor them or work with them or mm -hmm. know, you know, if we have some foresight to know that in a year or two we're going to lose somebody, who do we have for the next man up or yeah. for a better statement? Yeah, you know, in this day and, and age, yeah, up, people, harder, but still. yeah, people don't stay in their jobs forever, and you know, different circumstances, which we all understand. People come and people go, but we certainly, as you've heard tonight, make hiring from within a priority. It is my number one concern that we have the right person for the job, the most qualified person for the job above all, um, and it certainly has to be a good fit. Uh, this is a member of the executive team, and we certainly want to be sure that that person complements not only uh, my team, but the school district in general. Right. So that, that would be one of my high points, saying that they're from the system, they probably know how, and you know how it works, but and they got to qualify. But that's you know, right. They, they're part of it and have been there, and you know that's always that's always important. Okay. Mm -hmm. So and so what this does is this allows us yes to continue to use Mrs. Bass on an interim basis, uh, but and it also. Uh, would allow us to not have to keep coming back and say, okay, it's three weeks here, it's four, another four weeks or whatever. It will allow us to extend her um, contract so that we don't miss time and we aren't waiting for a board meeting. So it works on both ends. If I get somebody right away, then we don't need to have Ms. Bass here until November. If I don't get somebody in November, it will allow us to continue to search for a candidate. I would, I would think within a month or two we should be. Well, it, it really, you know, it, it doesn't always work as if it was a um, private sector, right? So we are a school district, and there are sort of seasons to when people are looking for employment. And an executive level one is particularly difficult to find. So we're in the beginning of a school um, year at this point, and folks generally are not looking to leave their school district in the, in the beginning of the school year. So that's why we, it's important for us to, number one, make sure that we have the right person to advertise it in the right venues so that we are attracting people, but also to give ourselves some, uh, some, a safety net in the event that we don't get someone. I, I, on, I, that, I, on that, I have a question on that, on that comment, though, is you said that this kind of position, though, is not ordinarily a contract position. Um, if we hire someone in, they're not on a contract. So it isn't like a school system has to give permission to, for them to leave, well, like it would be a teacher. Right. It's not that, but it's generally executive team. That would be as if Mr. P 
or Mr. Pender or Mr. Fister said, okay, it's September, but I'm gonna go ahead and leave you. Exec level folks generally are not looking to leave in the beginning of the school district because of the position that it puts their school district in. That's why I said what I said. Oh, okay. Okay, I didn't understand that. Yeah, it does, not necessarily that it has something to do with a contract, but it, you know, at this level, you really are looking to support your school district and your superintendent, and to leave in September, you know, might be a little um, difficult. It's a, a difficult kind of a decision to make. So I just want to be upfront about that, um, and that's just that's just the way it goes here. But we think that we will we will be able to attract at some point we will be able to attract the right candidate we just want to be sure that we are not leaving ourselves with a void because we can't be without somebody in hr at any point in time as you know aside from the director there are only three other people in that department one of which is clerical so um, it's important that we are not without someone when does the current posting end we, we generally run it for about between seven and 10 days, but we're running this one until filled so that it stays out there. Mm -hmm. So I would like to make a motion um, to accept this, uh, what are we calling it? Contract. Uh, for um, a contract approval for interim director of human resources mm -hmm. with the following changes that the agreement upon a mutual agreement of both consultant and QACPS shall end on November 7th, and to strike out this agreement associated length of service may be extended and by mutual agreement of the position of director of human resources may re remain vacant past November 30th, 2019. <coughs> give a second on, that, on second on that and then we'll have a discussion. Second. Okay, so I'd like to speak to my motion. Okay. Thank you. I chose to take out November 30th and make it November 7th. That gives us two work to board member meetings. If we do not have anyone by November 6th, we can renew her contract at that time if it has come, becomes necessary. I don't like, I personally don't like having open-ended contracts. So that is my justification for making the motion. Don't get me wrong, I applaud the, all the work that Mrs. Bass has done. Oh, absolutely. I, I, this is about I the am position, thrilled that she has person, been here. Right? And, uh, she has been an asset, believe me, but one money time and i'm i'm not an open-ended contract person so those are my justifications uh, i i will i will second that and you know the board's here we have meetings and I, we have work sessions we have open meetings i think twice so i think we have time that if dr kane has any issues or not needing something extra then it can be brought in front of the board and we can look at it at that time any other uh, input from the board Okay, we have a motion and a, did you have anything you wanted to add? Mm, no, but they covered it well. Oh, for me? No, I didn't. I just want to um, let you know that, um, yes, we'll be definitely working hard to try to fill this position. And just on the dollar amount, the dollar amount that we are paying is actually, we are not spending more we're spending less from when we had a person in this position so we are saving so i just yes. didn't want you to know that we aren't spending more okay than what's budgeted for the position correct there's no benefits or anything like no. that it's okay. just straight correct I, should i amend my by saying the budget source as well should i amend my no, amendment see no we see it on here okay. yeah but the budget source of FY 2020. Okay. Miss Miss Harper, to your point on the budget source, you'll see the note that this will most likely require a transfer that I'll bring to you between salaries and contracted services, which this board did with okay. my predecessor. You know, when we had right. to have an interim, you'll see that as well. So why would that need to to be moved? We've got that position. We've hired. Have the position, but we but this is a contracted services. position. Contracted services. Mm -hmm. It's not a salary where it's a benefit so you employee. Would take employee. It out of yes, we would take the one. So transfer. Right. Again, just for information only. It's not for your approval because it's within the same category. But I just want to make that it's make that note. It's balancing the books. Thank you. So we have a motion to approve the professional services contract to Mrs. Bass to assume the role of director of human resources on an interim basis, at the rate of six hundred dollars a day, um, to terminate on November, 7th. November the 7th. Um, eliminating. And, pardon? And eliminating. That's it. And the line. Which eliminates the last line of the contract. It changes the last line of the contract. No, it will come back in front of this board if there's an issue at that time if it hadn't been filled. Correct. 
and the budget source is FY 2020 operating budget. All in favor? Mrs. Wright, please call the roll. Well, Mr. Peter Fund, when your name is called, Captain Kelly? Yes. Mrs. Harper? Yes. Morissette? Yes. Mrs. Harlow? Yes. Mrs. Mr. Smith? Yes. I have five in the affirmative. Motion carried. Okay. Thank you. If, if I could revisit the CDW contract, I do not have access to page two. Um, and we can certainly bring it back in on the in next work session if you want to approve it. But just for edification purposes, all you're approving is the purchase of those materials that are listed on page one from that company that's listed on page one with the resources that are in that budget. If you're still uncomfortable approving it, we can certainly put it off. But there would be nothing I would think on page two that would supersede what's on page one because you're buying those items for this price just, from that just company. to be safe we'll wait until or if you th make a motion that we strike page one of two and we're only we're only approving one nothing else that's true we, we can do, do that. that as long as we're not i'm not signing well, something i don't know that though, effect. because okay. page suppose page, page two, two has did have pertinent information that affected our policy that we're working on yeah that's true i i, I don't i don't see I it. it i mean it we've bought from this company before but we're buying a good we're not buying a service i would totally be we can wait I, totally if we were yeah. buying a service we, absolutely we we're can, buying we, goods we can wait. okay i think we'll just wait thank you it was bid out right or it's a part of the meek the maryland educational ed, uh, enterprise enterprise consortium which 24 school districts in this maryland purchase all their technology through this same Consortium. Yep. Gotcha. We don't have a problem with that. We just want to see that. I understand. Okay. Thank you. It's just a large ticket I, item. Sorry. Nope. I'll Since one to. of these uh, contracts, we don't have to have a business meeting to approve. We could do it in our work session if we need sure. to yes. do it. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. So we'll yeah. delay it till the work session. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Next item is the field trip Queens County High School FFA to the National FFA Convention in Indianapolis. Uh, Madam President, uh, item 8.05, requesting that Queen Anne's, Ho Queen Anne's County High School Future Farmers of America uh, attend the National FFA uh, Conference Convention, rather, in Indianapolis, Indiana, which is an annual event that they attend each year. Okay. I make a motion questions? to approve the Queen Anne's County FFA to the <coughs> National FFA Convention in Indianapolis, Indiana. There a second? A second. Uh, were there any questions the board had on that, that particular field trip? I don't have any. Okay. All in favor of approving the um, Queen Anne's County High School FFA to the National Convention in Indianapolis? Mrs. Wright, please call the roll. Board members, please respond when your name is called. Captain Kelly? Yes. Mrs. Harper? Yes. Mrs. Morissette? Yes. Mrs. Harlow? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. I have five in the affirmative motion carried. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next uh, info, info item is the transfer notice. Yes, thank you, Captain Kelly. For uh, the month of August, there is no transfer. But as you recall, this is a standing item that we will have on the agenda. So when there are no transfers, I'll just report there are no transfers, and there are none. Okay. Why don't we just we'll just put that on the agenda from now on? No, no transfers. Oh, have transfer, this. but he'll just. There is, there is, there is leave it there. there will be for next month because of what you just approved with Miss Bass's he contract, but or at a minimum. But okay. for the month of August, there is no transfers. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Community participation. Do we have anyone who has comment? Anybody else? No. <laughs> Come on, Michelle. You're only, talk you're to only us. Person can talk. <laughs> okay. And then the next one is. Uh, wow, we're early tonight. That's good. This future uh, meetings. Uh, I did want to put in here though that the September sixth, which is Friday, is the Ken Island High School High School Turf Field dedication ceremony, being run by the county commissioners. Uh, that is going to happen at 6.30 before the game. I did notice the invite we got for Queen Anne's. It said 6.30 also uh, before the game, not during the halftime. But we'll have to clarify that. Just one thing said halftime and one said that. Uh, oh, somebody told me they have something at Queen Anne's too. Yes, Queen Anne's, well, Queen Anne's is the high school turf field. That's on September 13th. Though. No, no, I know that Ken Island had something already planned for their halftime, and that's why they moved us mm -hmm. to early. Yes. Somebody told me Queen Anne's had something going on at halftime, too, and that's my why. Was we'll have to check It's early. Time. It's early. Um, I can't remember what they said it was. It's not parents' night. Then September 10th, the county commissioner's uh, meeting at 530. That is when Mr. Bell will do his presentation on the ESSA consolidated plan that we we're briefed on today. On September 19th is our work session. 
at that work sessions from five to eight. October 2nd to the 4th is the May annual conference in Annapolis. And October 9th is our next school board meeting. And we also just yes. Remember, we have that on September down just. Oh yes, college. September 25th, right here it is, is, is the um, Project Bright Future they call it, and that's when they have a regional event for the CTE, and it's going to be at Chesapeake College, and it's it's from 6:30 to 8:30 at the Todd Performing Arts Center, and that's free, an event for parents, students, teachers, and the businesses to learn about career opportunities through the youth apprenticeship, which we were just briefed on and dual enrollment and other CTE programs. I believe that's the school. same night as the meeting about the new bridge span. Mm -hmm. kind of um, it school. was changed. So the um, bridge span one is going to be uh, in October. Okay. Right. Oh, okay. great. Right. Early October. We'll have the date for you. Right. And the turf that field, do you have information wise? Oh, um, it was moved because it's our veterans night game. So we that's have a halftime right. show planned that's for it. Right. That's for Kent Island. Right, Kent Island. That's why it moved to 630. It's before the game. Thank you, Ms. Patrice. You to add something. <laughs> Your turn next. <laughs> well, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, spot. <laughs> and welcome to uh, our, our board. We're happy to have you. I have a motion to adjourn. So moved. And second. second. Okay, all in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, meeting is adjourned. Thank you.